Sound all right? Yes. 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 So, first thing I'd like to do then is to introduce Ward Parks himself. He's yeah. in the first section, general introduction. Stay with God as a tool in my father's work for humanity. So I know you've seen him before, but give him a rousing hand here. Jibabe everyone, and welcome to the beginning of the study and celebration of Stay With God. Uh, as best I know, uh, this is the first time that Stay With God has explicitly been the <coughs> subject of an extended weekend like this. And one thing that is really apparent to me is that in three days we can do a little more than open the cover to the book. As a former professor, I can really say it would take a semester. Um, so reserve next year, six months, for a full semester study of it. I, we uh, did find on some of our Friday sessions the last two weeks that a single stanza uh, can occupy uh, a, you know, one for an extended period because the poem is so rich. But this will be a start. Part of the idea of this weekend was to not just talk about Stay With God, though we're going to be doing a good bit of that today and tomorrow, um, but there are actually three interwoven elements. One is to read it aloud, which we did yesterday, for all but one portion of it. Uh, from yesterday's experience, um, it seems that to read the whole thing would take about seven and a quarter hours, if ever you want to do that in the future. And by the way, I had a number of comments from people about how uh, good the reading was. Mm -hmm. It was really quite excellent. I found it to be a wonderful experience um, to hear it read out, even though I've read it so many times myself. Well, that's one element. Another element in this is to study, examine it from different points of view. And a third would be just to celebrate it in different ways. We're going to have some musical performances from it and a discussion of some of the artistic expression of it. All of this seems quite appropriate to Francis, who was something of a polymath in the arts. He was not just a poet, but had been a painter and musician and had an extraordinarily, extraordinary breadth of engagement uh, with culture uh, in so many ways, Eastern and Western both. The program, I'm just going to have it up here, Oops. Um, just to look at uh, what's upcoming. Um, we have four sessions, morning, afternoon, and two days. And in terms of the uh, just sort of the analysis and uh, discussion of it, um, those parts of the program relating to that, this was the concept. This morning we're going to be uh, have presentations that will look at um, uh, Stay With God in an overview way, in an introductory way. Uh, this afternoon there'll be a series of presentations that will talk about the individual books, say something about each one particularly. <coughs> on us, oops, I keep doing that instead of that. On Sunday <coughs> in the morning, uh, we're going to uh, look at some of the Illusions and backgrounds. Um, anyone who has read Stay With God would be acquainted with the fact that there's an enormous amount of reference in it. And uh, but, uh, Francis refers to all sorts of figures and artworks and religious moments from uh, the past. And his uh, knowledge was very, very extensive and quite global. And uh, I'm not the only one to have discovered uh, that when you go into these individual references, they're very, very enriching in terms of one's study of the poem. Um, he'll just make an illusion, but if you know what he's talking about, it's quite, it opens up a whole panorama. Um, this is one of the reasons why it would really take a semester to study Stay With God properly. But uh, uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about a few small details, unpacking them somewhat in illustration of what could be done for so much of the rest of the poem. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, um, there'll be some overview uh, uh, discussions, particularly pertaining 
to Book Five, uh, which is uh, the State of God is comprised of five books, and the fifth is actually more than half the length of the uh, entire poem. Um, so, but some of the other things that we're going to be having. Oops. Still learning how to use this device. Okay. Um, so this morning, I, after my general remarks, Ross is going to be talking about the biographical background and some of the cultural poetic environments out of which Francis himself uh, came. And then Jeff is going to be introducing the overall structure of Stay With God, the theme and its development in five <coughs> books. Um, and then Lorraine, Susie, Steve, and Amir will be uh, giving a musical expression. Not Amir? Okay. I see. will be with us in spirit. In spirit. A musical expression <coughs> of some material from Stay With God, which actually Lorraine did at Mirabad last year. This afternoon, the first uh, four presentations will be on books one, two, three, and four. I wanted to be sure we didn't neglect looking at the specific um, aim of each book. <coughs> Francis's conception is quite vast and quite amazing. And, uh, uh, and then after that, we'll have a, uh, a, a musical rendering from book four, which was <coughs> discussed by Jeff just before then, The Steps to His Feet. Of course, you all know Sam, who departed and went to his beloved uh, just three months ago. One of his l comparatively late <coughs> compositions was putting the first five stanzas from the steps to his feet into musical form, which we will render having practiced to perfection in the last few <laughs> weeks. And then Peter will be talking about archetypal feminine in the state of God, a very specific theme. Uh, tomorrow morning, Tian will be uh, unpacking some of the Chinese cultural references in uh, state of God, looking at what some of those backgrounds are. And uh, John Perry will be uh, talking about the, not about studying within state of God itself, but the artistic expression of it. And uh, may, may I refer here to the fact that you are in an exhibition hall at this very moment. And uh, when you have time um, to you know, look at some of the, the wonderful paintings we have on the walls, uh, this was prepared for this very event. And then um, John uh, and Jacob will do a performative, dramatic rendering of some material uh, from State of God. And then um, Jeff and Michael Michael's going to be talking about um, uh, a, a particular reference that's actually a very significant one to the three heralds of the new advent. And Jeff is going to be giving a, a relevant uh, a introduction to a relevant topic of the perennial philosophy. So this morning has a, that morning will have a lot to do with um, backgrounds and references within the state of God. <clears throat> As I say, you could spend, a, it would be worth spending a large amount of time unpacking the various things that are in the poem. It would take weeks to do it. And then in the afternoon, uh, uh, tomorrow, Jeff will be talking about the state of God is poetry. Lest we should forget that. This is poetry. It's not just sort of philosophy or cultural discussion. And uh, Ross will be uh, focusing on book Five and stay with God as a guide to the real a revitalization of poetry and art. And then I'll give some overview remarks. I haven't worked out what to say. I'll be illuminated on that by our discussions over the next two days. So there's a prospectus of what's uh, upcoming. For the various speakers, um, uh, as uh, uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, the speakers have to keep on time, too. So after 25 minutes of my 30 minutes, Steve is going to ring the bell. And after 30 minutes, he'll ring the bell again, <laughs> meaning I have to shut up. Um, wasn't there this nice uh, Hafiz couplet? I don't know where the home of the beloved is, 
but I can hear the bell of his passing caravan. So when the bell rings, it means the caravan is moving <laughs> off to the next speaker. That's to put it graciously for those of us who have to um, finish up our remarks. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to say I, a few things on, in general introduction of what I think uh, the significance, some of the significance of Stay with God um, in terms of Meher Baba's work uh, with humanity. Of course, who? I mean, it's not as though I know anything more about it than anyone else would. But I, I thought about it, and uh, that's a lot of re the reason why I felt prompted to uh, you know, get involved in, in this whole project. Um, why are we actually <laughs> devoting time to State of God? Well, one obvious reason is that uh, it was written by Francis Brabazon, who's the really the founder of Avatar's Abode, where we all are. That would be sufficient reason all by itself. Um, Baba spoke very highly in praise of it. Now, it is true that Baba would encourage his lovers by praising them often. But it seems to me that the order of praise that Baba gave to stay with God goes quite beyond that and marks it out as a work of true perennial uh, significance. I haven't ever tried to compile a complete list of some of the things Baba said, but here are some of the ones that I got together in writing up a little article for the newsletter here. <clears throat> Mara, writing to uh, Diana Dimple, this is from The Glow, a couple issues back, said, we have never before seen Baba so enthusiastic. Baba says this book is a masterpiece. It is so beautifully written. To quote Baba, he who will read this book will have read everything. And in no avataric period has a book been written about the avatar to be read by the avatar himself. Um, Stephen gave me this uh, uh, little quotation from, uh, that Francis uh, wrote in a letter in 1960. Francis said, I think the highest praise Baba gave Stay With God was, it will appeal to the highest intellects and to those with simple hearts. And I think that really does speak to uh, something essential about Stay With God. It is brilliant intellectually, and it is also deeply moving and very piercing. There'll be these lines that pierce through straight from the heart. It's quite extraordinary in that way. Um, Stay With God gives a presentation of Baba that is really, there's nothing else remotely like it. That was 50 years ago, but 50 years later, we have a very extensive library of books about Meher Baba, and there's nothing even approaching it. I'm not disparaging other works, but in the vastness of the conception of who Baba is, the epic conception, um, situating Baba in an enormous cultural, historical setting, um, and the poetic beauty uh, of uh, so much of it. By the way, can you all hear me? Am I speaking on the back row? Wonderful. Okay, good. Um, it's quite without any parallel even today, and it's hard to imagine anytime soon a similar such work having been created. So all those would be good reasons for devoting a weekend to it all by themselves. But um, beyond that, and this is particularly what I wanted to get to uh, this morning, I think that uh, Stay With God is really going to play a huge role in the creation of a new culture uh, around the avatar of the age. I don't, it seems to me that the role of the avatar himself, as opposed to through his lovers, is not to create a culture, is not to provide his own commentary, so to speak. But it's really the role of his lovers and the civilization that comes after. And it seems to me that Baba gave Francis a very unique platform that really no one else around him had in that respect. Now, okay, what is, and also I think that this question is going to be coming up now. Um, in a much more explicit way than it has in the past for the reason that the Mandalay era has ended and a lot of things I think are going to change in that respect. Um, 
And okay, what is culture to begin with? I would say, define it as values assimilated into life, both individually and collectively. The highbrow view of culture that it's something that the literati and artists and snobby people um, spend their time doing, I'm mean, a little facetious, but not too, is uh, not adequate at all. Actually, uh, its values assimilated to life in all aspects. And uh, a lot of what Francis has to say, um, I'll just read a little bit, some of these things. It's very clear that when he talks about art, he's referring to poetry, art, music, those things. But not just that at all. It's the assimilation of the higher values of God into art and the direct revelation of those higher values through the avatar and the perfect master himself. So right at the start, oops, I went one too far. Let me go back. Of uh, book five, where he talks about these things. Um, once men sang purely in the work of their hands, in the speech of their mouths, they knew that the avatar and the perfect masters were the only God on the earth, and that the saints were the doors to him. By God, men lived, and his name wrought their works. They went not out to labor, nor sat down to meet, without song attending. The leftover scraps from their singing we have gathered into our galleries and libraries to worship or stare at. This is so characteristic of Francis. Now, that this last a sentence describes what culture becomes what high culture becomes when it is alienated from life in general. But in truth, um, art and culture in the highest sense is present to everything that we do. Like when you uh, clean a room, or when you cook a meal, or when you, uh, you know, do a business transaction, um, or, or heal a patient in a medical practice, or all the various things that they do, it is really true that cult, there is a culture in all of these things. And the avataric transformation will extend to all aspects of life. So that music, art, poetry should not be seen as something apart from these things at all. I, this is certainly my opinion, and it seems to me that it is Francis's opinion um, also. Now, <coughs> The, there has been a culture connected with Meher Baba from the very start. It's not that there has not been. When you read about the life at early Meribad, he had a style of doing things, you know. It, they had to be practical, it had to be on time. Uh, you, I, we could talk for a long time about the kind of culture that Meher Baba cultivated around him. And uh, the Mandali too, uh, gave a certain culture. For example, they didn't encourage us to sit and meditate for hours and hours. Uh, there was a lot of storytelling if you went uh, to India. I guess Francis wasn't so much a storyteller, but among many of the Mandali, that was part of our culture. And um, other things like that. Uh, so that has been part of the life of the other world until this time. But in some ways it seems to me that it comes up with a more explicit consciousness now than it has in the past. And I'll give just one example that was from my own experience. In, uh, uh, I was involved with a lot of the birthday plays at uh, Mirabad over the last 20, 25 years. And uh, it would be common, especially early on, to say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Mera wouldn't like it. Or what would Mani say? And all of that, it's almost like a parental model. Like if we do this, the parents will get angry at us. And, okay, good, this was a way of assimilating the deeper truths. But fundamentally, the underlying question is, well, why, what is the reason that they would not like this? What is the value concerned? And at this point, the parents are gone, and we, I think it's going to become much more explicit. What are the values? Of course, we, there are fundamental things, Baba's godhood, et cetera, et cetera. But in all aspects of life, what are the values 
uh, that we're living at. It's not as though we haven't thought about this. I'm not saying that at all. But I think it's going to become much more of a conscious discourse. And where this kind of thing is concerned, Francis is everywhere. You know, this is what he, he provided a whole language for talking about these things. A lot of Stay With God, as many of you, we read yesterday, um, there are so many examples of it. He'll talk about, you know, Ram and Krishna and uh, great masters and all these people. That's true. But so many other of his comments pertain to values and a discriminative attitude towards values as applied to life. Um, now, here in Australia, uh, Francis has been central to uh, the lives of so many of you. I never met him myself. I really, he had this terrible habit of living in Australia, which is such a long distance from the places where I was. But I don't think that around the world, um, I mean, I think when I, when I first came to Baba, I read all of his work closely and others did. But I don't think in general there's such a consciousness of his work now as there was. But I really do think it's going to emerge into importance. Baba gave him a platform. There were other artistic people around Baba, other people involved in the arts. Um, you know, Margaret Crask, or Delia, or Quentin Todd, or Kitty taught music, and Narina. Uh, especially the Westerners tended to be in the artistic line, not the Easterners, I noticed, not so much. Um, and all of them were, you know, were deeply immersed in the artistic life, to be sure. But Baba didn't make talking about it part of their work for him. And he did for Francis. So I think Francis has a most unique role and a most important role for uh, the time ahead as matters of culture come up. For example, um, I, I have to cut it short because there's so much more that could be said about this, but I don't want to bring up examples that excite or, or anybody, but let's say somebody wants to do an anger management workshop, okay? Okay. Well, what do we do about that? What place does that have in our culture? In our Baba culture, you know? Somebody wants to do um, a play by Shakespeare. Well, no one would deny that Shakespeare is a genius. Um, is that appropriate at Maribad, let's say? At Mayorana, I'll, I'll go away from avatars about it. Mayorana, somebody wants to do a conference of the different religions, and some people from Buddhism and Christianity and Islam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do we do that? Well, it's not that Francis spoke to those things explicitly, but he did engage the problem, the, the question of how Meher Baba is situated in a broader culture. Who else did? Can you think of anybody else in our Baba culture? who spoke to those things in that way. Um, so I think he's really going to be one of the major foundations in the phase that we're going into now, frankly. Um, now, uh, I have so much more in preparation than I'll ever get to. I always over-prepare for those things. But let me go to another point, um, which is here on my outline. Dealing with Francis's critique uh, one of the characteristics of Stay With God, which is very hard to miss, is that the fellow had definite opinions on things <laughs> and did not mince words about them. Um, and uh, this, this is a task on how to use Stay With God, how to assimilate it, how to use it in creating a culture. Uh, I won't take the time to read some of the things that we might have read. I'll, I'll read just a line or two at the hand. I find them to be very enjoyable. I've never been upset by them, but some people, um, natural. In fact, he comments on that here. He's about the, the fact that he goes into <coughs> harsh comments that would be deemed harsh sometimes. But uh, for example, uh, here's what he says about those uh, uh, Musician, those literary artists, Dante gets uh, really gets the axe from him, although some praise too. But he goes to those handful whose work, from whose work something can be salvaged. And as to everybody else in the last five years, the rest, yoking words into yawns and snapping them, 
damp fingers. Isn't it great? I mean, uh, of course, those who are <laughs> trashed. And music, apart from the, the, this handful, rest swilling sentimental violence. Where I think particularly colorful is this last one, the artists, uh, apart from those ones from who's, whom he finds value, the rest. Mud up to the hawks, painting their eyelids pink and green. <laughs> when you look at 20th century art, it, it somehow brings a lot of paintings to mind. <laughs> so, and he'll say things about people like Shakespeare, or Beethoven, or Michelangelo, or Dante, the supreme artists of the Western world, whose genius no one could deny, uh, that just seem to dismiss them. So how are we to take this? Um, now, I'm just going to say that I don't think it is reasonable to expect all the Baba lovers of posterity to accept every <coughs> opinion that Francis expresses as Baba's own gospel truth. That's, that's just not, that's not going to happen. And I don't think that's approaching it the right way either. The point is not the particular opinion expressing, that he's expressing, but the discrimination and the underlying body of truths that they're coming from. Because even some of his most outrageous opinions, I do find, have some real point behind them. And even though you may reject that opinion, he really is talking about something quite real. I think that's almost always, I would say always true. I don't really, even in people where I think, hey, wait a second, Francis, you're not doing justice to this guy by a long shot. That doesn't ultimately matter, and I don't think we have to get stuck on that in the future. He identified, or Baba gave him, the standard on basis of which culture should be con constructed in the aftermath of this end. And the standard is, stay with God. Mm -hmm. Now, in the modern world, in the, among the intelligentsia, where I spent much of my life, God is a dirty word. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't even bring up God. You're, I would never have mentioned God in a positive frame of mind in any article that I ever wanted to get published. <laughs> Back in those days. And Francis was completely fearless about it. And I think that is part, in my opinion, of his value as an instrument in Baba's hands to help us not to be intimidated by the awesome spectacle of genius, of cultural achievement, of all these things. He would just take a hammer and go smash Michelangelo's David and Pieta as though it was nothing. <laughs> and it's not that we have to do that, but we have our own revelation to be true to, not all this stuff. And I think that's one of its great values. What do I have, five minutes? Ten. Ten. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm trying to say that it's some, some one of the authors of this rule. I want to obey it myself. And here's something else. Um, I mean, where Francis is very harshly critical of things, I don't think even in his own opinion, he's not trying to give a balanced and complete assessment of these characters. But he is, even those who would disagree with particular criticisms, I think more people would agree with this. When you look at the spectacle of the modern world, something has gone wrong. Wouldn't a lot of people would agree with that? When we say stay with God, would you say that that characterizes modern civilization, that everyone is staying with God all the time and focused? I mean, obviously not. What did go wrong? And I mean, a common response in the world would be to say this political party or that political party, it's deeper than that. It has to do with something that's gone on for a long time. And that is really what Francis is trying to identify. Now that project is well worth um, our, our efforts as we try to create a new culture based on Baba. What does keep us with God and with the avatar of the age? It reminds me, <coughs> this aspect of uh, Francis, of... Uh, This gentleman, Plato, I wanted to make this analogy. Um, some of you may have read uh, Plato's great dialogue called The Republic. Uh, one of 
the most famous works of philosophy in the Western world. It's ten books, and in the last book, Plato engages in a scathing critique of poetry. Now, ancient Greece, out of which he came, had hosted maybe the greatest poetic tradition in the Western world, surely one of them. I would rank it as the very greatest. Homer, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Pindar, uh, Aristophanes, unbelievable geniuses one after another, who had been right before Plato. And in his Republic, he was, uh, Socrates is the protagonist in it, is discussing what comprises the ideal polity, uh, the ideal state, the ideal city-state. And he's dealt with lots of matters, and now he's talking about what the role of poetry should be. And darned if Socrates doesn't banish it, basically, or most kinds of it. And in particular, he kicks out Homer. Now, <laughs> Homer was like, the role of Homer in ancient Greece was comparable to like the Vedas in ancient India, or the Gospels. I mean, it's not quite scripture, but it was a lot like that. And the reverence to Homer really couldn't be overstated. But uh, Socrates says, well, what does Homer do? He shows, uh, in fact, I have a slide of this, and it comes up a lot of times in the state of God. This is um, uh, uh, Hephaestus, and this is Ares and Aphrodite. I, there are a lot of references to this moment in Homer. So. Homer is talking about two, a god and goddess engaged in an adulterous relation with another god. Gods shouldn't behave like this. What sort of example is this giving to the world? You know, he showed gods in an unworthy way. Uh, Thetis, who was a goddess, uh, Achilles' mom, goes and begs Zeus, hey, help my son, make sure he wins. So Zeus says, okay, I'll do it. It's like bribery. You know, <laughs> the whole Trojan War, is to be decided because he's giving a favor to this goddess. So Socrates says, this is not worthy behavior of the gods and goddesses. Um, heroes will be suffering misfortune. They'll get up there, wail and complain. Well, you shouldn't wail and complain. You should bear it with stoic fortitude, right? <clears throat> so if this is what Homer is, he doesn't have a place in our republic. Now, whether or not that assessment of Homer uh, is Correct, and actually Francis would, was a big enthusiast of Homer, and so am I too, and many other people. The point is that Plato was undaunted by the spectacle of the towering genius of ancient Greek civilization in creating his Republic, because the Republic has its own purpose, and the things that serve that purpose can find a place in it, and the things that can't serve that purpose don't. Francis has done the same thing in his own way, but it's beyond a republic. It's the actual humanity of the future and its <coughs> dedication to God. And he's been quite fearless in going through and bringing discriminative judgments to bear on all the cultural history of the world and saying, what will serve this purpose? Now, whether we agree with his opinion on this point or not is not the essential thing. It's the fundamental enterprise and the fundamental courage and willingness to base the civilization of the future, which is going to grow out of the world of now, uh, on Baba's own truth and nothing else. And not to be afraid of uh, all these uh, legacies and structures and even the greatest of geniuses. The greatest of geniuses is nothing compared to our Divine Beloved. So this, in short, is what I think is part of the significance um, that, culturally speaking, in as a tool in Baba's work. At least that's what comes to me to say today. What do I have, about two minutes? Is that, am I done? No, five minutes. Five minutes. So these are some of the directions to go with this in the future, it occurs to me. Um, you know, in, uh, Baba gave this message in uh, 1932. He says, I see uh, the um, structure of all the great and recognized religions and creeds of the world tottering. Uh, then he says, 
all of this. The uh, organized efforts um, are being made to bring about the millennium. In some parts of the West, particularly America, intellectual understanding of truth and reality is attempted, but without the true spirit of religion, with a capital R. It is like groping in the dark. I intend to bring together all religions and cults like beads on one string and revitalize them for individual and collective needs. Okay, one is this beads on a string theme. We have uh, civilizations of the world with vast histories meeting now. Uh, how do we deal with this? Uh, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, Islam, I'm just mentioning the religions, Christianity, various indigenous religions, all of these are streams pouring into the present. Uh, now we haven't, the Baba world has not really had to deal with this yet because the world hasn't been interested in Mihir Baba very much. So we can just go along in our own internal life without worrying about it. That is not going to last. The time will come where we will have to be able to speak to somebody. If Mayor Baba says he was Buddha, Krishna, Ram, Jesus, Muhammad, etc., how do you explain this? How do you explain that? There will be a need to be able to speak to the greater world. And again, Francis Brabazon is a major foundation for our dealing with this. Baba himself would say, I was Buddha, I was Muhammad. Well, write those too. I mean, the Buddhists and, or let's say Jesus and Muhammad, I mean, they would be far from willing docilely to fall in line with such a proposition on Baba's part. Did Baba explain it? No. Why should he? He is. He is that. It's not his job to justify. But Francis now dealt with a lot of these questions about, how, you know, integrating these different traditions with Meher Baba. So that, I think, is one aspect of his influence in the future, what I think should be and will be his influence. Another is the educative function. In the future, there will be a natural interest and a natural need to find ways of transmitting some of the legacy of this avataric advent to the young, to people coming to Baba who haven't been with Baba before. Um, what, in fact, will be part, what will be programs like this? What will their subjects be, you know? Well, Meher Baba's own teachings or his own books and his life story are naturals. They probably hold the first place. But I think that uh, the role that Francis plays in um, creating a cultural nesting for that is really going to come up now. That's a... Uh, a second area. And just a third point um, about Francis's writing and his poetry, especially in Stay With God, but really everywhere, I think it gives a wonderful model for the integration of the head and the heart. Um, there certainly is a lot of head there. He was brilliant, intellectually brilliant, but it's never divorced from feeling. In fact, when I read it, one of the things that most strikes me is the tone, the tone of voice. He'll hit a note, he'll start a new stanza, and hit a, I don't know, there isn't really a good language for talking about this, but I'll notice he'll suddenly modulate his voice. Uh, he'll suddenly go into Aussie slang, or uh, suddenly it'll be a, de a passionate appeal um, that will arise out of this. Um, and I think that provides a marvelous model uh, for the future, for anything concerned with the study of Meher Baba, integrating head and heart in this way. So that's really what I had to say, opening up. How much time do we have for a quick Q&A at this point? Oh, well done. I let you go on because oh. your points were so relevant. Oh, I didn't oh. want to steal from Q&A though. Well, okay. <coughs> anyone want to repudiate all that I have just said? Yes, I like it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? I love your word messy. Perfect. Yes. 
came to Bernard just gave me a nest the other day, so I brought it to mind. Okay, well, shall we go on to the next? Uh, the next speaker. The next speaker. Thank you.